Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Corwin Monday Afternoon Webinar Series, your no-cost platform for superior professional learning. Today's presentation is Collaborative, Collaborative Leadership, Six Influences That Matter Most, presented by Peter DeWitt. Now what I'd like to do is turn the meeting over to Nicole Franks, Executive Marketing Manager for Corwin, to introduce our presenter today. Thank you, Jeff. It's my pleasure to introduce Peter DeWitt to you today, although he needs no introduction. If you've never heard him speak, his words are sure to leave a lasting impression on you. If you've been a participant of Peter's work before, then welcome back. Peter DeWitt is a former school principal in upstate New York and, cons and does consulting work with Corwin on professional development, including visible learning. Before becoming a principal, he taught elementary school for 11 years. Dr. Peter DeWitt has traveled the world developing content, visiting school sites, influencing policy, and presenting with thought leaders such as John Hattie. He's worked with educators at schools, districts, education service centers, and educational organizations, including the Council of Chief State School Officials. His presentations focus on school leadership, school climate, as well as safeguarding LGBTQ students and other social justice topics. His book, Dignity for All, Safeguarding LGBT Students, was published by Corwin Press in March of 2012. He was a consulting editor and visionary for the Connected Educators series published by Corwin. He wrote, Flipped Leadership Doesn't Mean Reinventing the Wheel, as part of that series. He's also the author of the best-selling book, Collaborative Leadership, Six Influences That Matter Most. Peter's most recent work, School Climate, Leading with Collective Efficacy, was recently published in August of 2018. His articles have appeared in education journals at the state, national, and international level. Peter's been interviewed by the major education associations, as well as PBS and abcnews.com, and was a guest panelist on the 2013 Education Nation, sponsored by NBC, where he sat on a school safety panel with Goldie Hawn. Peter's professional learning series with Corwin is based on his best-selling book of the same name. Collaborative Leadership is a series of workshops focusing on research-based influences that foster a supportive and inclusive school climate, increase academic and social-emotional learning, and maximize the efficacy of all school stakeholders. In today's webinar, Peter will preview that work for us, outlining what it takes to inspire real improvement with a collaborative coaching model of leadership. Peter, over to you. All right, thank you very much, Nicole and, and Jeff. Um, one of the things I'd like to, there are a couple of things. Uh, number one, I'd like to thank you all for being a part of this. I heard we have 500 people signed up for the webinar, which is really awesome. I appreciate that you would spend your Cyber Monday with me, whether it's uh, live or the recorded version after this is done. What you're going to notice up on the screen are three things that I, I want you to uh, keep in mind. The first one is a link to a Google Doc. And in that Google Doc, you will have access to every resource that I ever talk about um, when I'm doing the collaborative leadership work, whether it's a one-day, two-day workshop. The work's been adopted at the state level, and it's also been adopted at the university level where I'm working at the University of Oklahoma. Um, with cohort two, some members who are on this uh, webinar as well listening in, so thank you. But the, so you'll notice that the Google Doc has a lot of resources in it, including um, a copy of the keynote that I usually do around collaborative leadership. So please feel free to use that whenever you need to. Um, but lots of great articles from the people that I talk about. Number two, there's a hashtag, collab lead. And what I would love is to kind of do something Ed Chat style here, where I'd like you to, if you're on Twitter and you're looking to tweet out, I would love for you to use that hashtag and tweet to me. You can see my Twitter address underneath that. Tweet to me where you are listening from, where are you participating in this webinar from, because I always love to see who's participating and, and, and where they're coming from. Um, I know that my friend Will is paying attention. He's been on for about a good 45 minutes now, so he heard the, the prep going into this. Um, so thanks again for, for joining, and we're going to move forward. But once again, please make sure you tweet in and, and let me know where you're, you're tweeting from. 
The, the work that we're going to do today is a, a little bit different than other webinars that I have done because typically I've done collaborative leadership webinars. But as Nicole said, my book on school climate, which was co-published between uh, Corwin Press and the Ontario Principals Council, they um, this just came out a, a couple of months ago. So I'm starting to do a lot of work where school climate is concerned. So you're going to hear some of the uh, some of the things that I think are really, really instrumental in creating an inclusive and supportive school climate. So it's going to be a combination of both books. One of the other things that I want you to realize is that uh, uh, the collaborative leadership work is pretty ingrained in John Hattie's research. I've worked with John over the past four years. Uh, I've been very fortunate to do his work in North America and Australia and uh, a little bit in New Zealand as well. Um, and John and I present together quite a bit in the United States. Um, so he has over 1,400 meta-analysis, which are really large studies, and it involves over 300 million students. He started off in 2009 with visible learning, what we refer to as the white book, and that had 138 influences on learning. In 2012, he had visible learning for teachers, which had 150 influences on learning, and recently, he released 251 influences on learning. Number one is collective teacher efficacy, and that has a 1.57 effect size. And believe it or not, number 251 has a negative 49 effect size, and that influence is boredom. What we often look for in John's work is trying to get a year's worth of progress um, for a year's a year's worth of growth for a year's input. And that is a 0 0.40 effect size. So when you see some of these influences, you're going to see a 0 0.40. That equates to a year's worth of growth for a year's input. So the the other thing that I want you to understand is that John's research um, is, is tends to be, uh, there's a lot to, uh, to it. There are a lot of nuances. And what that means is that when you're looking at some of these influences, when you're looking at things like feedback, that involves a lot of different studies and the effect size that you are seeing is an average effect size. And I'll talk more about that as we go on. One of the things that I want you to think about is um, who is doing the collaborating? You know, very often principals are in a position where they're looking at their teachers to collaborate in PLCs and walkthroughs and those kind of things. But the reality is what we know from the work around collective efficacy and self-efficacy is that principals do not feel efficacious in everything that they are doing. So not only should be principals um, be the ones looking at whether teachers are collaborating in their PLCs, but principals should be a part of the collaboration. So who is doing the collaborating? So I just want to thank people like Liz Schroeder, who's listening, who's listening in from Idaho, and my good friend Neil Gupta, who is in from Ohio, and Rob Darling, who's in from Central Washington State, and Bonnie, who's from Canada, Dagua, and Brett, um, you're in from Iowa. Thank you very much. I love coming to Iowa. So we see Sarah in Denver, Colorado, and uh, Lynn in Virginia. So thank you so much for being a part of this. I really, really appreciate it. Um, what I would like to do as I am looking at tweets is give you the opportunity to look at the definition of collaborative leadership. It is up on the screen. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to read that. All right, so um, I do want to thank somebody who's listening in, a, a good friend of mine over the past few years is Terry Pickerel, and Terry is out of Bellingham, Washington, and Terry has been doing an extraordinary amount of school climate work over many decades, and uh, he's been a huge influence on me, so um, I'm a little intimidated that he's on the webinar, especially when I'm going to be talking about school climate, uh, but he's somebody whose work you should really be looking at as well. So the collaborative leadership, the, the definition that you've got in front of you, um, it's really important to look at the, the, the words self-efficacy and building collective efficacy. Uh, you know, ever since John came out with the, the research around um, collective efficacy, 
a few years ago when he looked at teacher, uh, you know, collective teacher efficacy was the number one effect size. Lots of people, including me, gravitated toward that research. But what, unfortunately, what happens sometimes is that we don't look at the nuances. We don't look at the deep amount of research. And over many months, I've had the luxury of reading into the research that John collected and also talking to people like Tom Gusky, um, who is at the University of Kentucky, who have taught me a lot about self-efficacy and collective efficacy, all of which you are going to benefit from today. This idea of working collaboratively together is really important. And this is a phrase that I'm sure many of you have heard. Um, and feel free to tweet out if you have heard this phrase in the past. Leadership is, is you know, when they talk about leadership, they say things like, oh, you're going to the dark side. And I heard that when I was going to do my leadership degree. And I, I have to be honest with you, it's one of the most destructive statements um, that I think leaders can hear because I don't believe that as leaders, especially collaborative leaders, we have gone to the dark side. I think we've taken an opportunity to get people to work together. Um, and that's where collaboration comes from. The interesting thing that you might not know is that the research around coll collaboration actually shows that collaboration doesn't necessarily work any better than if you did it on your own. And the reason why, that research comes from Kuhn, I talk about it in the School Climate book. Part of the reason that that happens is that we don't challenge each other's thinking. And if we want collaboration to work, we have to challenge each other's thinking. And that's the very reason we shouldn't look at leadership as going to the dark side because of the fact that we need to set a school climate where people feel supported and they feel like they can challenge each other's thinking. So let's get away from the dark side mentality and look at building this collectively together. One of the ways that we get to do this, and this was in the collaborative leadership book, is through meet, model, and motivate. And uh, you know, there have been times when I started to put this together when I was writing collaborative leadership that I worried a little bit because I was concerned that this might come off gimmicky, but it is not meant to. As an administrator, there are times that uh, as an administrative team, we would get together and talk about initiatives over many months. And then we would go back to our school, our individual schools, and we would roll it out to teachers and they would instantly resist. And we'd go back to their admin meetings and some administrators would say, those teachers, they just don't like to change. That's actually not the reality. The reality is we took so much time to talk about the initiatives at our admin meetings. We had that information in our heads that we actually went back to our stakeholders and we talked to them as if they had the same information in their heads and they don't. We do this with students. We meet them based on where we think they are because of their zip code or what their last name might be. We've all been guilty of looking at our class list and seeing that last name that kind of gave us a little bit of fear. We're meeting them where our biases think they are. What we have to do is really ask good questions to meet people where they are and not where we think they are. I do a lot of instructional coaching work for Jim Knight. And this is something that instructional coaches need to be able to do because very often instructional coaches do so much research and they have so much information in their head and then they meet a teacher and they kind of assume that teacher knows all the information already and they don't. The other way that we do this is with families. We drop acronyms all the time in education. We use words like scaffolding and differentiated instruction and we're saying it as if the people we're talking to really know what we mean. They don't. And we have to come to a common understanding. And when I get to self-efficacy, you are going to see why that is so vitally important. What's next is this whole idea of modeling. We need to model what it is that it looks like if it's going to be successful. So let's use this scaffolding idea. Many times we'll say, well, we need to do scaffolding in the classroom. But the person we are talking to, the teacher that we're talking to, might not necessarily understand what scaffolding means. So... We have to do things like when it comes to meet, say, if you could paint a picture of scaffolding, what would that look like? And then we go into modeling, which is, this is what successful scaffolding actually does look like. In self-efficacy, the research, we learned that we 
we learn vicariously by watching others. That's why modeling is so important. So we meet them where they are. We model what it is that it's going to look like, that we know what a successful image of scaffolding looks like. And then we motivate the teacher, the person we're talking to, to be able to do it on their own. So when you're looking at the slide, I want you to think about it. Where do you meet people? Do you expect them to have the information already that you have? Or do you ask them questions to see what their level of understanding is? There are six influences that matter most, and I am going to go through these um, individually. And I'd like to thank people like Elizabeth Jones for, uh, for joining us from Diamond Bar, California. And uh, Nicole Franks, my friend Nicole, who's from Frisco, Texas. And Helen, who is, uh, well, she's just participating in the webinar. She, wants, she doesn't want to let me know where she is. Um, so there are six influences that I think matter most. And one is instructional leadership. It has a point four two. And early on, I said that John's influences are an average. What often happens in his influences is he looks at school leadership. Now, believe it or not, school leadership has an effect size of 0.33. It's actually gone down from a 0.39. So yes, those leaders who are listening to me, you are so close to being effective. But when you pull at the moderator of just looking at instructional leadership, that effect size is 0.42. And that is what I'm going to hone in on while we're together for this short period of time. Now, you might be wondering, so if instructional leadership is so powerful, why isn't this called instructional leadership six influences that matter most? The reality is instructional leadership is powerful within a school. And often when we're talking about instructional code or instructional leadership, we're looking at within those school walls. Collaborative leadership is about how we engage that last group at the bottom, that family engagement. Instructional leadership isn't always encompassing a family engagement. Collective teacher efficacy, I already told you that is John's number one, and it has been, 1.57 effect size. PD, professional learning and development, has a 0.51, feedback 0.75, and assessment capable learners 1.44, and then you've got family engagement at the bottom with a 0.49. And I would just like to thank all of you. You are like killing it on, uh, on Twitter right now. Uh, you are tweeting out like mad, so I'm trying not to be distracted. And thank you for tweeting out some pictures as well. Number one is instructional leadership. That's a point four two. And what I looked at when it came to instructional leadership is this idea of what are the things that we need to be able to do to be instructional leaders. And what we need to be able to do are things like create an inclusive, safe, and engaging school climate. And I'm going to talk about those non-negotiables at the end when it comes to school climate that Terry Pickerell knows so well as well. But there are those things that you need to make sure that you are doing. So when it comes to creating an inclusive, safe, and engaging school climate, it means how do the kids feel when they're walking into your school every day? How do families feel when they come in? Do they feel like they're a part of the community or do they feel like they're visitors? Being visible and engaging. As school leaders, we've always heard that we have to be visible. But I think we need to be more than visible. We need to be engaging as well. We need to know more students' names. We need to be in the hallway, not just patrolling and saying, where do you need to be? What, you need to get to class. We need to ask some questions like, hey, what are you learning today? And treat kids like they're doing the right thing until they prove to us that they're doing the wrong thing. Very often, we do the opposite. Collaborative leader, instructional coach. I've learned a lot from working with Jim Knight. And what this means is that we need to co-construct goals with our teachers before we go in to do formal observations. We need to be able to provide effective feedback, all of which I'm going to be talking about this evening as well. We need to explore data collaboratively. Part of the problem is we hide data. My friend Jonathan, Jonathan Cohen from the National School Climate Center says it best, for too long, we have been using data as a hammer instead of a flashlight. Instructional leadership is about using data as a flashlight, looking at the common themes and trying to get more information out of it. Focus on learning. You know, it's really interesting working with John because he says, we, we spend too much time talking about adult issues when we need to have more of a focus on learning. 
And that means when we go into classrooms and we sit down next to kids, we ask them, so what are you learning? Or do you go in and do walkthroughs and do observations and you just solely focus on the teacher? We need to take our focus off the teacher and put our focus on the students. And communicating high and appropriate academic expectations for all. And I would have told you four years ago when I was still a school principal that we do this, but we don't. I've met a lot of principals that have expectations and a lot of teachers that have expectations based on the zip code the child is coming from and not necessarily meeting them where they are. So, Jeff, this is where I'm going to ask for your help. So, um, Jeff is going to have a poll. Now, Jeff, how do you want me to do this? I will just open the poll right now and people can respond to it and then we'll close it down and you'll see the answers and you can chat about the answers that you Do have. I need to stop sharing my screen? No, stay right where you are. I'm going to stay right where I am. And here we go. Oh, very good. So, we're going to get into self-efficacy. And the poll question is, what is self-efficacy? Do you think it's A, the confidence to take action, B, situation-specific, C, perfection in every situation, or is it D, which is both A and B? Yes, I have fun putting these things together. So I'm going to give you a few seconds. What is your answer? Is it A, B, C, or D? We'll leave it open for about another 20 seconds and then we'll close it down. While you're doing that, I'm just going to say thank you very much about all the tweets. You are all really, really amazing. Um, you are definitely throwing out a lot of tweets there. All right, Jeff, you want to close it down? I think they have enough time. And what do you have for an answer, Jeff? Okay, we're going to keep you on the edge of your seat. We're not going to tell you what the answers are. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to move on and uh, let's see how to, all right, so self-efficacy has a 0.63 effect size. It refers to beliefs in one's capabilities to organize and execute the courses of action. So this is written by uh, Albert Bandura, who was a, a researcher out of Stanford University. And even though this is 1997, it's been around since 1977. Bandura has done a ton of work when it comes to self-efficacy, and I'm going to give you a lot of the insights around self-efficacy, which is Peter, why it matters. Would you, Peter, yeah. would you like the results of the poll? Yes, I would love the results of the poll. All right, so 50% um, of the people stated both A and B, 20% stated uh, A, and a few people stated B. Okay, so... For those of you that stated D, which was both A and B, you are correct. But then again, if you actually put in A or B, I guess you're correct as well, right? So self-efficacy is the belief we have in our own capabilities. And it has a 0.63 effect size, which now you know is well over that 0 0.40 uh, that equates to a year's worth of growth for a year's input. The reason why self-efficacy is really important is because of this screen. Some, this is an example um, up in front of you. So let's say scaffolding, because I've been talking about scaffolding. Scaffolding increases student learning. We know this. However, what happens is we often drop the word scaffolding, but we don't come to a common understanding about what scaffolding means. Very often when I'm doing instructional coaching work uh, for Jim Knight, we will talk about student engagement and we'll say, well, as a coach, we're going to go in and check out student engagement. Well, the reality is if I didn't have the conversation with Jeff, who's the teacher and I'm the coach and say, Jeff, so if you could paint a picture of student engagement, what would that look like? 
and Jeff thinks it's lecturing um, and maybe sometimes compliant engagement, but I think it's authentic engagement where kids are leaning in. If we don't have that discussion, then we're going to be on the we're not going to be on the same page when we go together to do that kind of classroom observation. So in this case, scaffolding increases student learning. What often happens is we never talk about what scaffolding is. So therefore, we might say, okay, you know, at the faculty meeting, we need to see more scaffolding in our walkthroughs. Well, a teacher with a low level of self-efficacy when it comes to scaffolding is going to go back to the classroom and it's highly unlikely it's going to be implemented in the classroom because they just don't know how to do it and they're too embarrassed to tell you. But with teachers with a sense of self-efficacy when it comes to scaffolding, they're going to implement it in their classroom. So we're gonna see it when we go in to do our walkthrough. So too often when I'm working with leaders and teachers or even instructional coaches, they'll say, well, what do we do with resistant teachers? Well, one, maybe we don't look at them as resistant. Maybe we look at the language we used. Maybe we look at those, those techniques, um, the student learning techniques and teacher techniques, and we have good discussions about what that looks like because maybe they're not being resistant. Maybe the reality is they don't know how to put it into practice. And what you need to know too is that self-efficacy is situation specific. And that's why I said the answer to that poll is D, which was both A and B because we feel efficacious in certain areas of our leadership or certain areas of our teaching, but we don't feel efficacious in others. So for example, you might have a teacher that is really good at de-escalating a student in the hallway, but it, when it comes to using a technique in the classroom, like reciprocal teaching, which has a high effect size in John's work, they might just say, nope, I've tried that before, it doesn't work. And you're thinking, Wow, how can you be so good at de-escalating students who might not even be yours in the hallway and yet so resistant to using a teaching technique like reciprocal teaching? And the reality is that's self-efficacy at work. And as leaders, we cannot possibly feel efficacious in everything that we are being asked to do because leaders are being asked to do more with less and you don't feel efficacious in every area of it. So Tom Gusky has been really super helpful in this area. And what Tom says is that in order to raise self-efficacy, because it's so much harder than just, oh, I have to go in and raise Nicole's self-efficacy. It's so much harder than that. What we need is a protocol in place, a built-in mechanism, meaning instructional coaching is a built-in mechanism. Professional learning communities is a built-in mechanism. Teacher observation is a built-in mechanism. And then what we have to be able to do is use evidence that teachers trust. Unfortunately, in these times of uh, state testing in New York State, where I was a school principal and teacher, state testing uh, did not provide us with effective feedback. It did not provide us with um, itemized you know, information when we got it back from the state. So we didn't, as teachers and leaders, trust that information. You have to find evidence teachers trust after you have that built-in mechanism. After you find that evidence that teachers trust, maybe locally developed measures, something that's valid and reliable, the teacher needs, that, uh, needs to see that strategy make a difference within weeks and not months. We can't wait months to see if a strategy is going to, use, if be, if a strategy is going to work. So once again, we need to have a built-in mechanism, like a PLC, to be able to talk about these strategies, like reciprocal teaching or, go back to the example of scaffolding. We need to provide teachers with evidence that they trust, and then we need to see that the strategy makes a difference within weeks and not months. When we do that, we start raising self-efficacy. Now, collective efficacy has a 1.57 effect size. And as I'm talking, I'm gonna have you read this definition. Collective efficacy refers to that collective self-perception. Now, some of you might be sitting here saying, do you need to have a high level of self-efficacy in order to have collective efficacy? And the answer is no. Because we can't feel efficacious in every part of our job, that's the power of collective efficacy. When we work collectively, with others, that can raise our level of self-efficacy. So when I said 
at the beginning who is doing the collaborating. If it is a leader who is always telling teachers that they must collaborate and yet the leader doesn't collaborate with them, what's happening is that leader is losing the opportunity to actually raise their own self-efficacy. It is really important in our school climate that we are very open and honest about those areas that we feel are a strength and those areas where we don't feel very efficacious as leaders and teachers because only in those moments can we come together and work collectively around a problem of practice and actually learn from one another. So where are some places that we learn from one another? Now I need you to keep in mind that collective teacher efficacy is that belief we have in our team. You know, um, sometimes I'll work with football coaches. They have a belief in their team that they can beat any opponent that comes their way. But unfortunately, we as principals don't always have that same belief in our teachers. So in order for that to happen, in order to have that belief, we need to have, we need to build collective efficacy. And we do that in a variety of ways, some of which I will get into, but professional learning and development is one of those protocols in place where we can work collectively together. You can read more about it on the collaborative leadership workbook page 99, but what I'm going to refer to when you have access to this article in your Google Doc is from Andy Hargraves and Michael Fullen. They wrote an outstanding paper called Call to Action, Bringing the Professional Back In. They published it for Learning Forward back in January. And what they say is that we need and teachers need professional learning and development. This is what's going to help raise our sense of collective efficacy. This is what's going to help raise our sense of self-efficacy. Professional learning, you can see the definition that's up on the screen. It's deliberately structured. So I'm going to go back to using the example of scaffolding. Scaffolding is one of those things that we talk about, but we need to come to a common understanding of what that is. And then we have professional learning around what does scaffolding actually look like and what are the outcomes we need to look for. Professional learning is when we look at that, that structured piece, that scaffolding, that reciprocal teaching, that classroom discussion, whatever strategy we're talking about, and we start talking about what are the measurable outcomes we can look for as well. Professional development is slightly different, and I love that Andy and Michael separated the two. Professional development is about developing mindfulness with our staff and building a team this is something that's going to help build collective efficacy. For example, when I was a principal in a faculty meeting, I used the Compass personality test, north, south, east, and west, and each one has behavioral characteristics. And people had to choose which direction they fit most into, and then they went to that side of the room. And we were able to look at each other and see, I'm a south. So this is why I feel this way. Oh, he's a North. That's why he feels that way. That's an area that helps build mindfulness about the team that you're working with. So one is not more important than the other. Professional learning is really important if it is a strategy you're going to be focusing on and you're looking for student outcomes. Professional development is important if you're looking at building a team. If you are going to really be able to challenge each other's thinking like we know collaboration means, if you are going to build trust within your school climate, you need professional development as much as you need professional learning. All of those are going to contribute to building collective efficacy and self-efficacy. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to think about this. I just want you to kind of reflect on the professional learning and development that you are a part of as a principal or a teacher. Is your professional learning and development at the surface, deep, or transfer level? If you're on Twitter, please feel free to tweet it out. So I'll give you a few seconds to do that. And I'm going to say that I just love looking at the tweets that you're sending out. Thank you to Joel for, for tweeting out so much. 
You know, many times our professional learning and development has been at the surface level. It's been, you know, if you're looking at faculty meetings, it's been about delivering information. If you're looking at professional development, sometimes school districts only have two days of professional development that they have scheduled within the year. So it's about delivering information about state initiatives. What we need to be able to do is look at ways that we can go from surface to deep to transfer level. I did it by flipping my faculty meetings. Flipping means that we co-constructed as a stakeholder group at school things that we wanted to be able to work on, and then I would find one resource and send it out to teachers about three days before the faculty meeting so they could read about it, and then they could bring examples. So for example, scaffolding, we're going to go back to that. Say you want to have deep learning around scaffolding. I would flip my faculty meeting and I would send out a resource about what scaffolding might look like. Now that might be a video from the teaching channel or a blog from Education Week. And then teachers would have to bring examples of what their scaffolding looks like to the faculty meeting and then you share best practices. Where are some other areas that you can focus on to go from surface to deep level? Well, surface to deep level questions. The growth versus the fixed mindset teacher talk versus student talk, or even negative versus positive interactions. These are all pieces that we can look at. What I would like to move into is the next um, area, the next influence that matters. And I realize that we are going fast through the six influences, but the reality is I want this to wet, wet your appetite so you can you know, look at collaborative leadership, tweet to me, ask me questions. I'm gonna give you email my email address at the end. What do you want to learn more about? Um, because if that's the case, please feel free to reach out to me and we can talk more about it. Feedback has a 0.75 effect size, but what you need to know is that feedback only sticks when it's wrapped around a goal, which is learning intention and success criteria. If you are just merely going in and doing a walkthrough and you're giving feedback and the teacher hasn't co-constructed a goal around what you are looking for. The feedback you are providing is not going to stick for them. Same goes with students. If we're gonna get feedback, it needs to be wrapped around the learning intention and success criteria. The other thing that makes feedback so incredibly complicated is that we have feedback triggers. I wrote about this in the school climate book. This comes from the work of Stone and Heen, who are Harvard researchers, um, and they, they work in the law school at Harvard. They, uh, Douglas Stone and Sheila Heen, found that there are three triggers that go off when we get feedback. The truth trigger means that the person is upset about the substance because it's off or unhelpful or simply untrue. That's the way we feel about it. There's the relationship trigger. This is tripped by the particular person. It's what we believe about the giver, that they have no credibility whatsoever. This doesn't just happen at school, this happens at home. Say you have a spouse or a partner who does not work in education, and they tell you all the things that need to change about education. Your relationship trigger goes off because it's tripped by that particular person. And number three is the identity trigger. It means that it's hurting the identity that we set for ourselves. Jim Knight talks about this in instructional coaching all the time. We need to videotape ourselves in action because what we think is happening in the classroom, we feel like we are teaching like it's Mr. Holland's opus. The reality is if you videotape yourself, you might find that only 70% of the kids are actually authentically engaged. So these are the triggers that go off. The identity trigger is that when somebody gives us feedback that shatters the identity we set up for ourselves. The other thing to keep in mind is that Stone and Heen say there are three forms of feedback that we should be always looking for. One is appreciation. It means thanks for working so hard and doing, doing such a great job. Then there's coaching feedback, which means here's a better way to do it. And then there's evaluative feedback, which shows you where you stand. The problem is, uh, Stone and Heen say, is that you and I, my friend Connie is on, and on Twitter and she's on the webinar. Now, Connie might be my principal and I'm her teacher, but Connie and I never talk about the kind of feedback that she's going to give me. And perhaps 
I think that, you know, I want to impress Connie. So she comes in to watch me observe or watch me teach. And she does the observation. And I think the kids are awesome, right? And it's just a great lesson. And I go into the formal observation conversation. And I'm really looking for Connie to just say how much she appreciates how hard I worked. And then I sit down with her. And she gives me a value of the feedback to say, here's where you stand. And it's not really in line with what I'm thinking. So what Stone and Heen say is that one piece of feedback is not more important than the other. It's about, do we have a common discussion about the kind of feedback we're going to be providing and the kind of feedback we should expect? Now, assessment capable learner has 1.44 effect size. This all, this is where we, we get to, right? We're raising our self-efficacy to use different teaching strategies so students can be more engaged in learning, right? We're, that's why we're trying to raise our self-efficacy in those situations. We're building collective efficacy among our staff so that we can come up with a problem of practice and say, how do we really get all of our kids to be engaged in school? We work on things like professional learning and development, where we can come up and we can learn from one another through vicarious experiences. And it all comes down to, you know, how can we build assessment capable learners? How can we get students to understand where they are in the learning process, how they got there, and where they go to next? Now, many of you might look at this from an academic standpoint, but this is where I'm going to bring in the school climate standpoint. Now in the school climate book, I talk about this. Students need an emotional connection to their school community. They need to know that when they come into the school that you care about them. So there are many different things you can do, but use artifacts that they understand, music and pop culture. Understand cultural nuances. In the school climate book, I get into the idea of minoritized populations, which I learned from Sean Harper who's a, a professor and researcher at the University of Pennsylvania. Minoritized populations are typically called minority populations, but in reality, they're really not a minority. So it's understanding cultural nuances with our minoritized populations. Sometimes it's our African-American students. Other times it's our indigenous populations. I do a lot of work in North America. So we look at Native Americans, but in Canada, they're called indigenous populations or First Nation students. In Australia, we're talking Aboriginal students. It's understanding those cultural nuances and not just teaching from one perspective. So I said earlier that there are going to be some um, non-negotiables. Well, we need to have things like school board policies that are going to protect and be inclusive of all of our students. And I'll go through these quickly one by one. We need to have images in the hallways. When you walk into the school, when students walk into the school, do they see images in the hallways that represent who they are, that look like they do? I worked in a very diverse school when I first started teaching in Poughkeepsie, New York, outside of New York City, at a very diverse classroom. I made sure that the images that were hanging on the walls were look they look like the students that we had in the classroom. Inclusive curriculum means that we use language that is inclusive of all minoritized populations, whether it's indigenous populations or whether it's our LGBTQ population. My doctoral research was on how well schools safeguard our LGBTQ populations, and they weren't doing a good job of that. So inclusive curriculum means that it is inclusive of all of those populations. If we're gonna have a phrase like all means all, then that means all of those minoritized populations too. Inclusive books and novels, a common language and understanding and training for professionals. First and foremost, we know as school leaders, if we want to really have assessment capable students, the need, they need to be emotionally connected to our school and not feel like they're being bullied, that they know that they're being protected by our, our school leaders. And that's where school board policies and student codes of conduct are vitally important. In New York State, we have the Dignity for All Students Act. And in there, we had to have school board policies and codes of conduct they used inclusive language and said that no student could be bullied based on their size, gender, race, religion, or sexual orientation or gender expression. 
Those are important for us because they give us the basis of how we can lead. This comes from my friend Tim Lauer out of Portland, uh, Oregon. And uh, he was not kind enough to provide this picture from Orchard Elementary School in Portland, Oregon. Um, you can see just by looking at the images of how kids could feel really connected to this. Images matter. If images didn't matter, Facebook and Instagram wouldn't be so popular. We need to have inclusive curriculum where we can have debates around anything from gay marriage to our minoritized populations, how African Americans are feeling in our country right now. Um, all of those things are part of the inclusive curriculum that we need to be able to talk about. And as you can tell, this is why I started off by talking about collaboration and the need to be able to challenge each other's thinking and having a school climate that's inclusive because where people can feel trusted and they can feel like they can be themselves. We need to have inclusive books and novels. You know, when I was a kid, my dad died when I was in fifth grade and my mom never remarried. The reality was no teacher of mine ever read a book where a father had passed away. So I always felt very different. I felt like an outsider looking in, in my school. I love when I walk into school libraries and I see sections that are inclusive of all of the populations that are within the school. And common language and understanding is hugely important because I can go back to using the word scaffolding like we had from before, but the reality is we can take scaffolding and we can actually talk about things like LGBTQ. What does that mean? Common language and understanding around transgender students in school climate right now. One of the reasons why I did my doctoral work in safeguarding LGBT students and finished in 2010 is because I knew it was a population that was rising within our schools and people didn't know what to do about it. So we need to have a common language and understanding about the, all of those populations. And I get it. These are tough things to be able to talk about, but it is really very necessary. And training from professionals who can keep it simple. In upstate New York, where I live, unfortunately, about an hour away from me, there was a school where a health teacher in seventh grade wanted their students to learn more about transgender students because quite frankly, it is part of the curriculum in New York State. The problem is they invited somebody from an outside agency called the Pride Center, and that person who came in printed out a 42-page document for every seventh grade student around transgender students and all of the words that come along with transgender students. And all of those seventh graders brought that home. And as you can imagine, it made the news. The reality is somebody missed a step there. They didn't get a training from a professional who understands the needs of teachers and students. So when you are going to train, when you are going to look at inclusive topics, when you're going to look at some topic that you know is going to be controversial, it needs to be training from professionals who understand that. But honestly, it's not always about the inclusive part. Even when I'm doing trainings on John Hattie's work, I need to find a balance between John's research, which is very complicated, and make it practical for practitioners to be able to put into use. So this is just important for everybody. But these are the important kind of non-negotiables where school climate is concerned. And we are going to go into family engagement. And quite simply, I just want you to think about these kind of things. What about your families? How accurately do you explain what it is you do? Do you use language that they don't understand? Now think about it. We use educational ease all the time in schools. And when we do that, it makes parents less likely to want to talk to us. So by the language we use, we could actually be creating a wall instead of building a bridge. So do you actually explain what you do and do you use it in a way that families can understand? John Hattie has some great research that he did with Janet Clinton in New Zealand called the Flax Mirror Project. I write about it in the School Climate book. And they interviewed families at, from high poverty backgrounds as they were bringing their kids into kindergarten. And about 90% of those families said, 
We want our kids to graduate from high school and go to university. By the time those same kids were in fifth grade, two thirds of the family said, we want our kids to graduate from high school and get a job. It's not that getting a job isn't important, but what made them lower their standards for their own kids? And sometimes it's by the way we talk with them and the expectations we set up. So I say things like, do we explain what we do? You know, I've got friends like Star Saxteen that talks a lot about feedback as opposed to grades. The reality is that's a great thing to be able to discuss, but if we don't talk to families about the importance of feedback over grades, then they are going to be our, our implementation, implementation dip. They're the ones who are going to fight against us and say, why aren't we seeing grades? What is this feedback stuff all about? And quite honestly, as a principal, I shared the mandates and accountability that were happening within our schools. I shared the curriculum changes that were beginning to happen because families didn't understand that. And the last one seems a little bit odd, but it says relationships with universities. We were a, a model school. We were a professional development school for a local university. It took me a few months to realize that our families didn't know that. And that's something to be proud of. That's something they need to know. The rhetoric around education is so negative sometimes from a national standpoint. We need to do what we can to combat them. Share that great information, share that stuff that is going on in your schools that you think families need to be able to know about. Now I talked at you a lot and I, um, I'm going to open it up to questions because we still have about eight minutes left. You have my email address right in front of you and you have my Twitter address, but I just wanna remind you of some things. We talked about instructional leadership it has a point four two. Quite simply, when you walk away from here, I want you to think about when I go and talk to students, do I ask them what they're doing or do I ask them what they're learning? When we look at self-efficacy, it's about knowing that we don't feel efficacious in every part of our job and that's okay. Sometimes what that means is that we have to come together and we have to have common dialogue about that thing that we don't feel efficacious in. And what that takes is collective efficacy. Believe in your teachers, believe in your team, and create professional learning and development opportunities that are going to help do that team building around that learning. Flip leadership is something I always talk about, and you have several blogs in that resource that I gave you at the beginning that explains flip leadership. Assessment capable learners. If we want our students to understand where they are, how they got there, and where they're going to next, they need to be emotionally connected to our school. All of our students need to see images that represent them. And not just images that represent them, but actually are positive representation of them. And then when it comes to families, are we talking at them or are we talking with them? So I wanna thank you for your time. I am going to try to take up the questions for Peter. Please send them using the chat. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat. And as we wait to do that, I'm gonna- Peter, I have questions that have come in during the meeting. I can give you. That would be really great. Thank you, Jeff. So here we go. How can we establish a culture of collaboration among leaders of different schools when there seems to be so much competition? Oh, that's a that's a woo. That's a question that's going to take an hour in itself. I, you know, I think that's something um, that superintendents really need to be able to look at. And I wonder if the person asking the question, what I would like you to think of is, what do you control? and what don't you control? You might not control how all of the leaders within your, your district interact with one another, but what I'm wondering is, are there a couple of school leaders that you can connect with? Don't always look at those things that we can't control. Start looking at, are there two or three different leaders that I can connect with, and maybe we create a boxer group, and, which is a free walkie-talkie app, walkie talkie app on our phone, and we create our own little PLC that way. Um, it's hard to answer that question because if you're not the district leader, then you need to look at what you do control. If you are the district leader, my thing would be, 
What kind of conversations do you have at those district administration meetings? How do you foster less competition and foster more collaboration as far as do you flip those admin meetings? Um, do you look for input from all of the administrators? Do you allow people to vicariously learn from one another? Okay, Jeff? Terrific. I have another question. In what ways can we measure teacher efficacy? Um, there are actually some really great resources in that Google Doc that you have access to. Um, Megan Shannon Moran, who is out of um, the College of William and Mary, was kind enough uh, to I use a lot of her research um, in both collaborative leadership and school climate, and you'll see access to some of her stuff in that Google Doc. But she actually has teacher efficacy scales that you can dive down deep into. So when you scroll down on that Google Doc, look for the scales, and that will automatically bring you to Megan's page, and you can learn more about that there. So that's one of the ways that you can look at um, efficacy. Terrific. Um, and I, I think that brings us to the end. The other questions sort of related to what uh, you just mentioned. I will send you the questions that I have, and you can answer them and send them out to everybody later in the week with the video. Yeah, and I want to thank people like Liz Schroeder who just gave me a nice compliment about the webinar. I'm sorry, sometimes webinars can be very difficult because I'm talking at a screen. So thank you for all the tweets because that makes things so much better. And like I said, if you have deeper questions that you don't want to ask now, you've got my email address in front of you. Um, I know that Nicole is going to want me to move on to a couple of other things. So. Um, Nicole, I will let you take over here with two awesome webinars that are coming their way. Thank you, Peter. And I have been, I didn't want you necessarily to move on because I've been watching the Twitter feed as well and kind of commenting on the side um, and love the um, collaboration that is actually happening online. It's really great to see and really affirming, um, especially folks that feel like they've learned something because that's our purpose. So um, thank you for that, Peter. Um, I know I, uh, will re respond to the testament of everyone that's been listening that that was incredibly enlightening. And um, after hearing you speak many times myself, I le learned even some new things today. So really appreciate your time and your preparation in this webinar. Um, to those of you that have been listening online uh, or following us and also following us online, um, I want to make sure that you all know that we have other upcoming webinars through Corwin. Um, next Monday, we will have James Nottingham and Martin Renton speaking about using dialogue and how to develop the language of learning. Um, obviously, even pertinent to some of the things that Peter mentioned today about the kinds of academic language that we use um, with our students and even potentially our parents and communities. Uh, and then the following uh, Monday, December 18th, we'll have student-centered assessment, strengthening student ownership through impact teams with Paul Bloomberg and Barb Pitchford. So please join us for those upcoming webinars. Um, register so that you can receive the webinar recording if you can't join us live. And you can go to the next slide. Sure. Thank you. Oh, look at that. Look That's at a that. very important slide. <laughs> That's right. Um, Peter mentioned his books today. He talked about the research that he did for collaborative leadership as well as school climate. I loved hearing about all of the um, features in school climate that he brought to light in the webinar today. Uh, and I would, I would encourage you to take advantage of the 20% off. It's a great discount. You can use that discount code um, N17194 uh, at corwin.com to order the book. So please check those out if you don't have copies of those already. Um, everything that Peter spoke about today, as well as many other tools, um, including one of my favorite parts of his school climate book, which I would have loved when I had been in the classrooms, um, is, an, is a risk assessment on students um, that could be potentially at risk. So great tools to be able to support your implementation of the influences Peter described. So I, uh, I, Nicole, I will add, so Joel McLean um, is asking, will the link be shared? Ah, yes. Thank you for reminding us, Joel. Peter, you and I both, both forgot to make a, mention that. Um, yeah. the, 
the Google Doc link um, that you saw in there in, in Peter's presentation that was earlier on slide one, um, we will be sharing that in the uh, follow-up email that goes out to all of you. So those of you that attended today will receive the recording for this WebEx um, as well as your certificate of participation. And then we will also include the link to Peter's Google Doc in that email. So please keep an oh, eye out for that. Okay. Yep. It will come from Corwin Press. So if you signed up to receive um, email notifications when you registered for the web, uh, webinar today, um, you'll receive that as well as your certificate. We will um, send that out to you within the week. So it takes a couple days for us to get the recording up and then the certificate made. And so you will receive that, um, if not by the end of this week, then the beginning of next week. And what I will do, and just for everybody that's listening, what I am going to do is I will also tweet out the link using the hashtag Collab Leadership 2. Okay? Thank you, Peter. Um, I don't, I think that's the last slide, right, Peter? Just uh, maybe click. It is, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Then I will say goodnight to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Peter and Jeff, also for moderating. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening and a great week. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for joining today. I really appreciate it. All right, good night. All right, good night.